Hello, everyone. I am Caitlin Donnelly, Program Director for Nonprofit Vote, and I want to thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Using Mapping to Reach Underserved Voters. Correction. Uh, we're going to talk about using mapping to reach high potential voters. So as you'll see on this next slide, we are switching up some of our language and framing um, starting right now because we know that for one, identity precedes action. So instead of reinforcing the behaviors we don't want, not turning out to vote by calling people non-voters or low propensity voters, we're going to start calling them high potential voters. So this is just one example of some of the messaging and framing you'll hear from us, including a webinar coming up in July that will focus on messaging exclusively and how you can use it to your advantage based on the work of researchers and people in the field. Um, so you might notice that, you know, we trip up a little bit in terms of talking about this stuff, but we're doing our best and we hope you come along for the journey. Um, so I actually just want to get pretty much right into today's topic uh, because messaging is great. We're talking about mapping today. So we have a great agenda. We have lots of awesome speakers um, and they have so many great insights that I am going to pretty much just roll right into it by introducing our very first speaker. So uh, we're starting out today with Caroline Mack. She is our research and field coordinator here at Nonprofit Vote. She's interned at the Census Bureau. She co-founded MIT Vote uh, to get students informed and registered around local, state, and federal elections. And she's used mapping to great effect in a lot of nonprofit vote reports, including our recent America Goes to the Polls and Engaging New Voters. So I will slide it right over to Caroline. Thank you. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, I'm gonna make myself a little bigger. Okay. <laughs> so uh, what is mapping? Uh, the mapping we'll be talking about today is really a potentially new way for you to look at data. It can be a tool to explore data, gain insights, and visualize it along geographic boundaries like state lines, city lines, counties, and zip codes. It helps us see things that would otherwise be hard to see just from a table. So who uses mapping? Lots of people actually have been using mapping for a long time, including all levels of political campaigns. They use it to decide where resources go. Uh, university and policy researchers use it. Local government officials, urban planning and zoning, banker and real estate official professionals when valuing or lending, and news sites like the Washington Post, you may have seen a lot of the powerful maps on health equity disparities of COVID-19. But we're here today to share with you some ways that nonprofits can use mapping in your voter engagement and use it as a way to promote equity by identifying and reaching households that are missed by campaigns. So let's look a little more into why we might use it. We talk about high potential voters as also the ones that have been most left out of the process. In the neighborhoods you serve, mapping can be used to identify and locate more voters in an area where your name might already be trusted and known, or where you may already have a particular knowledge of the neighborhood that traditional campaigns might not. So voter and civic engagement for us is also about empowering communities. So being able to organize in a specific area can help them have more clout when elected officials see that their area is voting at higher rates. But with limited financial and manpower resources, we know we need to be strategic about where we invest the work, especially because we know these voters need more face-to-face -face conversations and engagement to be invited back into the process. So mapping can help us do that equitably by helping us look at demographics and turnout. But even beyond voter engagement, there are more reasons to invest in mapping. Mapping can help your nonprofit strategically pick event locations partnerships, and where to focus that outreach to equitably maximize your impact and resources. Mapping can help us visualize inequalities powerfully through demographic data. And here's a really salient example. This project mapped areas all across the US that were particularly impacted by redlining. This map of Philadelphia you see shows the areas in red marked as high risk for lending. 
This had direct impacts on the disinvestment in often communities of color because lenders used these previously unpublished maps to exclude them in loans and therefore home ownership. Here's an example also of how mapping was used to empower a community. The West Philadelphia Landscape Project educated the community on how a buried river was causing cave-ins along the floodplain and polluting the water. They pushed to have the empty lots that you can see in the green boxes near these lines revitalized as community gardens. So I just copy pasted these maps on top of each other to see how it overlaid and it's not surprising. You can see the correlation of vacant lots uh, in the disinvested zone right above my head. Um, and using mapping ahead of time can help you avoid furthering inequality between neighborhoods. So before you start, a couple things. First, you should assess your tech capacity needs. Try ready-made solutions like Policy Map, Map the Vote, and L2, which you'll hear about two of those today. And there are also like deeper for a deeper dive. Check out the census data. Google your city and state data if there's anything available, which there often is. And actually reach out to State Voices after they speak about their voter tools. So today we won't be covering about how to visualize data and mapping, but if you're interested, tools like Tableau and Ta Data Wrapper are really great for visualizing and they're free and to display maps for your discounted for nonprofits. So I'm gonna quickly show you policy map and kind of what that ready-made solution looks like. So this is policy map um, and they basically take census data and make it really easy to like play with and work with. So I'm just gonna click open map and this is a public free edition. There may be a couple prompts that tell me, oh, you can't do it, but. Um, so I'm gonna show, type in my location or a location, I'm gonna click Philadelphia. And so you can zoom in. And there are a lot of demographics that you can pick here, like population, race, incomes, poverty, housing all these different like demographics that can help you see where the inequalities are. So I'm gonna click poverty, click people in poverty, click all. And it tells you kind of the percentage based on census data. You can see the source there is 2020, 2010 decennial. And you can see where that area where we were just looking at, which was really disinvested right here, high percent of people in poverty. And you can also, just one more, home values, median value, and it'll show you all the different percentages. So this is the really lower, lower median home values according to this map in this area. So that's it. And I will turn it over to our actual speakers to start their presentations. Thanks, Caroline. I actually really quickly wanna uh, see if we can get a poll launched um sorry i didn't warn you about this kimberly but we should have one poll in the queue because i wanted to find out you know you all registered for this webinar but have you used mapping before so let us know you've used them extensively maybe you've used them in once or twice occasionally in the past or maybe you've never used them before um so take a moment uh to fill out that poll um Normally, nonprofit vote is really advocating that you are just engaging the people who walk through your doors. Obviously, with COVID recently, maybe it's the people that you've made wellness calls to, or just the folks that are already engaged in your organization. Um, but as Caroline mentioned, mapping can really help you spread further into your community. And so um, when we have our tools speakers come up just in a moment, um, they'll show you what's really possible and how you can leverage their tools. Um, so why don't we give that one, um, about five more seconds for everyone to get their poll answers in and then we can share those results because um, I'm sure we're, we're all curious. Um, so more than half of you have not used these tools before. So this is great. Thank you for attending this webinar. For the folks that have used them extensively, we would love to hear about um, how you've used them, if you've used them really effectively. 
Um, so you can share that in the comments. Um, you could also share a little feedback in uh, the end of webinar survey. But for now, I do want to introduce um, our first uh, tool speaker. So today we have Julie Oliver. Uh, she is the executive director for Register to Vote. She is a healthcare finance expert who ran two aspirational 100% PAC-free campaigns in the US House of Representatives, Texas 25th Congressional District. Later, we have another Texas speaker. Hey. Um, in addition to her new role as executive director of Register to Vote, Julie serves her community by volunteering weekly at a local food bank and in a volunteer board position for Give Inc. and has two decades of healthcare finance and tax law experience. Thank you so much, Julie, for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Caitlin, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Caitlin, I think um, Anna from uh, Civitech is going to be joining me, but she might be in as somebody else, Corey. Uh, she put it in the chat and she's going to actually demo map the vote later before we get to map the vote i just want to share a little bit with you um, about how i i stumbled on to register to vote um, not even as an executive director but as a candidate running in 2018 in a competitive primary i met the guy who started it his name's jeremy smith by knocking on his door and it's um kind of a funny story he slings up in the door points at me and goes i've been wanting to talk to you and so I at first thought, oh my gosh, I wonder what I did to upset this guy. And he goes, no, 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 I just want to tell you about this idea I have. And I'm going to give you a super quick primer on uh, how to get registered to vote in Texas, because it is not easy. In fact, in Texas, we have this uh, novel uh, way of registering voters called uh, VDRs, Volunteer Deputy Registrars. And you have to get deputized in every county if you would like to get people registered in every county. And if you take a voter registration form from somebody that is signed and you are not deputized in that county, you have committed a state jail felony by touching somebody's signed voter registration form. Um, it goes back to the Jim Crow days of Texas and trying to keep certain segments of our population and our communities unable to vote. And so this is a way to get around that. It is a just a website, registertovote.org, and you can check your voter registration. If you aren't registered, you can complete a form and it will be mailed to you. You don't even have to have a printer. You don't have to fill anything out except for on your computer or on your phone. And this will take you, um, this will, I'm sorry, you'll get sent a form. It'll have a postage paid envelope inside and that postage paid envelope is what you stick your voter registration form in and mail it back in. So it's really interesting that we have these really onerous laws to prohibit folks from getting registered to vote. And this is a way in Texas that we discovered we can help folks get around that. Um, one of the other ways that we've been able to do it is finding folks who have moved. One of the other interesting areas of Texas uh, voter law is if you have moved and you don't update your voter registration and you're honest with an election official, an election judge, and say, no, I moved six months ago, you don't have the ability to update your registration then and there. And typically what happens is the voter will cast a provisional ballot. They don't even know they're casting a provisional ballot. And if there's not an overlap between races from your old address to the new address, um, some of your votes could be cast out. So what we have done at Register to Vote, um, ensure oh, anybody can use this tool, is finding folks who are unregistered or who have moved and need to update their registrations. And in Texas, since August of 2018, we have actually registered 750,000 Texans. And if you'll go to the next screen, Thank you. Yeah, um, we're going to talk about Map the Vote. That's what we're going to hear for. But it's really interesting. We also have created these fundraising maps. So you can look at a map of a precinct and say, oh, gosh, there are 52 potential unregistered uh, voters here. I think I want to fund that precinct and, and basically purchase all the registrations and the mail to send to them. Um, again, you can use Register to Vote on your phone, your uh, laptop. Uh, and then we were doing vote by mail applications as well in Texas to be mindful of coronavirus. Can you go to the next screen? So this is what Register to Vote looks like. It'll take you, if you it's a very, very functional website. Um, and it'll just take you here where you can check your voter registration. It says confirm my registration. And if you aren't registered or you see an address that you used to live at, but you don't live at it anymore, you can go and actually complete a voter registration form. 
All right, can you go to the next screen? So unregistered voters received, again, a pre-filled out form in the mail, no printer is necessary. All they have to do is pretty much sign it. Um, there are a couple of identification questions. They fill those out, instructions are included. Then they put it in the postage paid envelope and mail it back in. And if you'll go to the next screen, this is the part that gets really fun. So the other tool that Register to Vote has developed is uh, what is basically the inverse of the voter file that is layered over a map. So you can see all these green dots on this cell phone. If you go to mapvote.org, um, it'll geolocate you where you are and show you the households that don't have registered voters or they are likely unregistered voters. Now, it's not going to be able to tell you if somebody is eligible to get registered to vote. And this is not, let's say, sometimes a great tool to use when I go to the University of Texas because we have a lot of exchange students who are studying at UT, they aren't eligible to vote. And so it's not gonna be able to tell me if those people are eligible to vote. Um, it's just gonna show me that, hey, it looks like there's an unregistered person living at this address. But this has been a great tool that volunteers can, can use. It's nonpartisan. You get to go into your own neighborhood and, and, and I crack it because Jeremy who, who started this, um, says that his entire neighborhood is registered to vote. He always is geolocating for the folks who have newly moved into the neighborhood. And he goes, he wants to be the first one there to get them registered to vote, which is really awesome. But yeah, you can see volunteers can work solo or in teams. And you, over time, you clear the dots off the map by getting folks registered to vote or by even just helping us with the data saying, hey, this is somebody who's already gotten registered to vote or somebody who's ineligible to be registered to vote. And then if you will go to the next tool screen, um, there you go. So this is also, you know, again, ways of us trying to be really creative. I'm gonna hand it over. I see you are on now, Anna, yay. Anna is on actually as Corey, who is her counterpart, but Anna will be joining me today. Anna, will you unmute yourself real quick? I certainly can. Hi, Thank team. You. It's nice to meet you. Julie, fantastic job. Um, so if you guys don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and give you the absolute quickest demo of Map the Vote that I can muster. So let me pull up my screen. Um, let's see. Let's see the best way for me to share this. Okay. All right, I have no way of confirming that you guys can see this, but hopefully you can. So on this screen, you will see a map with all of these green dots. Um, so essentially, this tracks me in Austin, Texas. Um, two best practices for going on at mapthevote.org. Make sure that you are logged in on either Google Chrome or Safari to make it the, the easiest experience. Um, this is accessible either via a desktop, a laptop, but I don't imagine you using a laptop in the field, um, but it's, you usually use your phone to knock these doors. It's, uh, hopefully post COVID, you'll be able to make a lot of progress. Uh, so what you're seeing is just a map of Austin, Texas. It works in every state. And you see that we are surrounded by a sea of green pins. So each green pin represents a likely unregistered voter in the area. And so this is uh, pulled from public data sources, especially with recent movers. Uh, so people who have not updated their voter registration yet according to the state voter file. So what we're going to do is usually, I'm on a kind of a, a demo screen right, right now, so you won't be able to see my current location, but usually once you're out in the field, you'll see your current location denoted by a glowing blue dot. Um, so let's pretend that we are on Tilly Street in Austin, Texas, and we want to find the nearest likely unregistered voter. So let's go ahead and click on this green pin here. So once I click on that, you will see uncontacted because Map the Vote is a free to use web application. We do not want to release people's personally identifiable information um, because again, this is free access. So all we're going to see is the person's address to make sure that we're at the right place. And then you will click tap to start questionnaire. And as Julie so beautifully um, explained, Map the Vote kind of hosts the register to vote technology on it. 
So once you theoretically knock on that person's door, uh, we've got a registration script that was created by experienced canvassers just to help you, um, you know, start a conversation. It's got a couple use cases in here uh, to engage with the voter and ask them the right questions. But the magic of this is that you can check this person's registration live. If you click this red button, it says check or submit voter registration, it takes you straight to registertovote.org. All you're going to do is ask for their name. I'm gonna put in some test information, press continue. Already pre-filled with their street address, it does the dirty work for you. All you need is their date of birth, so I'm gonna put in mine. And of course, since I don't live at 4512 Tilly Street, it's not gonna say that I'm registered. So it'll tell me that I'm not registered. And of course, since we're in Texas, we have to, uh, go the, the mail route, as Juliet explained. Um, we're going to skip past, just for demonstration purposes, this contact information field, but usually folks can enter their email uh, and phone number uh, for potential voting reminders, but I'm gonna unclick that and press confirm my registration. And it will tell me that I'm not registered uh, at that particular address. And the way it works is I'll just make sure that all of the information that the applicant had preloaded into that form is clear and correct. And as, as Julie has explained, all of that information, like the name, the address, and the date of birth, will be pre-filled onto a federal voter registration application that gets mailed to that person's address. So I know that I'm on the loading screen of Doom, um, but that's kind of how it works. And if I press register to vote, you'll be able to choose register by mail. If you are in a state that does offer online voter registration, register to vote links directly to the online voter registration portal of that state. So it makes it a lot easier. Um, but let's say that we went through this entire cadence of making sure that we've got the mailing address correct uh, to see where the person can receive their voter registration application form in the mail. Um, we're gonna choose my residential address, make sure all of that is clear and correct, and then press submit. So once that status change is done and that person has had their voter registration um, confirmed or changed in this case, sorry, I've got a chihuahua, um, we're going to press everyone registered because we did have a successful registration. That turns that green pin blue. I know that I'm probably talking a lot, but one more thing that I want to add is that when you're out with a big organization and you're knocking doors in the same area, all of this information um, will refresh, like every status change will refresh within about 30 seconds. So you won't duplicate any other volunteers efforts. So this is a super interactive, easy to use interface. We've got a legend here under the help button where you can see what each pin means if this is your first time using Map the Vote. And you can always contact us if you need any troubleshooting or assistance. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it back to Julie and the rest of the team, but thank you so much for listening to my spiel. Great job, Anna slash Corey. Um, you know, this is really, again, it was a tool that was developed to, to really address some of Texas's voting uh, issues and voter registration issues. And I saw, a, I saw a, a question come up, how many people are actually willing to put their information into this? Thousands and thousands of people have done this. And it's been a great tool. Even the League of Women Voters uses Map the Vote. You can actually be a VBR in Texas and use the Map the Vote tool. You can go to the form and if you're deputized again, you can actually take the voter registration form somebody from somebody um, if you're deputized. If you aren't deputized, again, this is a great tool to say, hey, you can put this in my phone, but you even better yet, you can put it in your own phone and it goes to a non nonprofit um, that will print out your form and mail it to you. And um, we are looking at ways of sharing this, this data and we want to be sensitive, but for folks who are newly registered um, other nonprofits that are doing the work of engaging voters and getting out the vote, we want to be able to share that information. We have to be careful with who we share it with because it has to go from nonprofit to nonprofit. But again, it's allowing more people to have access to the ballot box, and I think that's a fabulous thing. And thank, thank you, Caitlin, for having us today. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Anna, for that awesome demo. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of questions coming through on the chat. So if you do have questions for our panelists, I ask you that you throw those in the Q&A box um, and we'll answer some of those questions live at the end. But I see that Julie has already been in there answering some of those questions directly via text. So make sure you get them in the Q&A box so that you and everyone else can see those answers. Um, and so 
Now we will uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, so we have Paul Westcott, who is L2's Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer. For the past seven years, Paul has led L2's product development, partnerships, and sales slash marketing teams. Uh, prior to joining L2, Paul worked for NBC News, Fox News Channel, and most recently iHeartMedia, where he created and hosted a daily talk show and podcast covering news and politics. So uh, we have someone very much with the finger, their finger on the pulse. Uh, thank you so much, Paul. I will pass it to you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for everybody at, at Nonprofit Vote um, for giving us the, the platform here to kind of talk about what, what we do and, and especially in the context of mapping. Um, so, um, you know, as you mentioned, I am Paul Westcott. I'm the EVP at L2. And today we're going to talk about sort of mapping the actual voter file. The last presentation uh, was a great deal more about um, obviously non-registered adults. In this case, we're going to be talking about those who are registered and, and what that looks like. If you can go to the next slide. What we're going to talk about is sort of our core you know, underlying voter file information. And we'll start there. Um, and, and then what goes on top of it. We initially start with the voter files from all 50 states in Washington, DC. L2 maintains and has maintained for our 50 plus year history in the business um, relationships with secretaries of state. We've, um, we've worked with boards of elections at the county level. We collect all those data. We put them into statewide files and then a nationwide voter file of approximately 210 million adults at this point, or excuse me, 210 million voters that we have as part of our database. From there, we clean it up. The voter files are notoriously bad in terms of having duplicates, people recently deceased, people who have moved out to a new state. So what we're doing is trying to provide campaigns, nonprofits, academic institutions, media organizations, um, government officials with the ability to research and utilize the voter file in a way that typically hasn't been used um, in the past because it's gonna be cleaned up in a, in a way that they could actually use the data. Um, on top of all the core underlying voter file data that comes from the states, and having worked for years both in, in the voter and consumer data fields, voter file information is typically highly underrated uh, because there's a lot of data that you actually get with the database itself. You're getting vote history. That's, that's transactional data. That's knowledge of when somebody did something, which is, in this case, casting a vote, maybe they pulled a primary ballot for a Republican, a Democrat, or a nonpartisan, or another, a third party, um, you know, uh, party, where they, they actually pulled the ballot in a primary. Um, we have donation information, so that's known donor data. Now, that doesn't come with the voter file itself, so what we're doing is then going to other sources, bringing in that information, and layering it on top, so that includes the donor information, that includes uh, demographic data, like things like ethnicity. In some cases, age isn't even available with state voter files, so we're bringing that in and appending it. There are many cases where party ID isn't available, so we're modeling that in all 50 states in D.C., so we're taking all this data and bringing it together, cleaning it up, appending hundreds of fields. It's around 650 plus standard fields. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, on top of that, we're also including, oh, next slide, for uh, the models. There we go, the L2 national models, 110 models, um, again, built in tandem with our partners at Haystack DNA. And these include a whole host of different issues where uh, allowing our users to go even deeper than that core underlying voter file. Now, I just threw a lot of information at you, but I think the best way to display this and go through this um, is actually me showing you the platform itself and showing you our voter mapping tool. Because what we're doing is taking all this data a tagging it into the tool so users can actually access it and use it because data means nothing unless it's visualized. And that's why I love this presentation and, and this whole this whole seminar, because essentially what we're talking about is visualizing, being able to tell stories um, with data. Nope. Could I, uh, could I take over and share the screen at this point? I'd love to be able to do that. Let me just make sure. There we go share my screen. So now what you're looking at is our voter mapping tool. This is a web-based 
uh, platform. Again, it is for, uh, unlike the last presentation, this is actually limited use to those individuals who are working on campaigns, associations, um, nonprofits, universities, pretty much anywhere where the voter file is legally usable, you can use it for those purposes. And it's web-based. You would log in with a username and password that we would assign to you. And anybody interested who fits into one of those qualifying groups, and there's a lot of them who can use the voter file, um, just you'll email, email me. The email will come up at the end um, and we can get you set up. I'm gonna zoom down to a specific area just to show you the granularity of the data. And you can see we can get down to the street level and now to avoid any privacy concerns because this is being publicly shown, I'm not gonna click on anybody's individual household, but you can actually click on the individual balloon, which is tied to the rooftop lat long of that individual household. We're in the state of Florida now, as I mentioned, we're in all 50 states in Washington DC and we have a nationwide application as well. Um, but it allows you to see into that household. So, and this is colored right now by political party, which you can see on the key on the right-hand side, um, where you'd actually be able to go in and see all the demographic details and background we have on these individuals. So this is one of those things where you can see in a very clear use case, the ability to go in and find those voters who you're looking for. So if I went in and let's say we have a polygon tool, and again, I'm going very quickly through the features here, there's a ton of functionality, but on its surface, let's say you wanted to cut for a walk program, an area around this court, you would actually just be able to draw in here. And now you can see the number of voters that we have in the lower left-hand corner, about 187. And then you can go down and say, well, actually I only wanna to talk to Democrats and uh, nonpartisans, let's say. And it's like those individuals. And now you've got your list of 158. And from there, you can get even further by going and saying, well, I only want those people who are 18 to 40 years old. Oh, and I only want those individuals who have a telephone number. I'll just pull up cell phone numbers who we have. So 31 of them have a phone number. I don't know why you'd want that for phone for door knocking, but the point is the technology is there that allows you to actually get down to this granular level, make the selections and all inside this tool, you can save it as a universe. You can then export the data in a CSV format. Um, that at that point is when you purchase something. So in our system, I saw some people asking about cost of all the things that we're talking about here. This, this is a L2 is a business. Um, so we, we we do charge for use of the data. Um, for a universe of this size, we would provide the platform at no cost to our users. However, um, once you make a purchase, it's 2.5 cents per record or $25 per thousand records. Um, so that's how you make those, those immediate selections. Now, typically our users are going in a really aggregated way. They're not zooming all the way down and potentially using it you know, in that really granular way, although there are some I'm sure who do, um, you also have the ability, and I'll pull the map back up, to make these broad-based selections. So you can go into area, and let's say we want a specific congressional district, you can say CD3, zoom to that area of the state, and then you can build your audience from there, um, again, making these selections. Um, another big thing that you know, and, and again, this, this allows you to see, you know, where there are pockets, where there are individuals of a certain group of voters, a certain subset of voters. And this is what's so important about visualization and being able to do that and making those selections on the right hand side. So it's pairing both the mapping technology, which, uh, you know, at the beginning of the presentation, we talked about the, the sort of the different tools that are out there for mapping, but mapping is great, you know, if you have the data and data is great, but you really need this mapping component to be able to see exactly what you're doing. One of the other elements we have in here is, is the ability to change this dot coloring again and the visualization where if I wanted to say broad ethnic groupings, I could then click here, click on dot coloring and the dot coloring on the map should change. Here we go, just changed. You can see that we have black for African-Americans, you have blue for Europeans or whites, green for Hispanics in our broad ethnic groupings. We also have large groups of individual ethnic categories, but where you could see where a lot of these individuals are. And we do all of this coding at the individual level. So you're able to see these individual households and other things like that. So it's a lot of very rich information that you're able to glean just by seeing it. 
We, uh, L2 serves 300 members in the US House as well as 75 Senate members for their constituent outreach needs. And the biggest thing with what they, they end up doing is they'll go in and members of Congress will see this and they'll say they didn't realize they had, let's say, a Vietnamese population, uh, which tend to be higher potential, we'll call them high potential voters. They don't typically turn out as, as much. So one member said, we need to find individuals um, you know, in the community, let's see where, where these individuals are. And they use the ethnic grouping matching. They were able to find a, a large, large pockets of Vietnamese voters and go and speak to them, speak to their issues and, and ultimately turn them out um, in the next cycle, in the next election. So it's, it's moments like that where you realize the power of the visualization and being able to see where these, where these voters are. We have built in, and this will be one of the last things I show you because I know I'm running up on time here, but one of the things that we have in here built in as well is the ability to go in and let me see here. Um, we obviously have complete vote history going back decades. We've been in, around for a very long time, but we also have the vote performance and vote frequency scores. The vote performance scores allow you to see those individuals who have never shown up. So in the state of Florida, you have what we will call here 0% voters. And you can see, again, still mapped by ethnicity in this case. And we have those who are, have not been eligible to vote in an even year general election. So you can take these new voters and these 0% voters who have just chosen not to go to the polls and reach out and speak to them. So it's a way to, again, instantly be able to see these different groups and organizations. There's a fantastic piece. I highly recommend you check it out if, if, you, if you have a chance. Um, NPR did this. Uh, we, we supply data to the New York Times, NPR, CBS News, and a lot of other places. But what NPR did was very creative, and they found the precinct in the US, which had the single lowest turnout of all precincts. So taking the millions of precincts that there are using our mapping tool, and basically we're able to go into neighborhoods and say, you've never shown up, but you've been on the rolls for X number of years, searching by registration date, why is that? And actually speak to some of these individuals because you want to know what what's you know what's the reason. And a lot of it comes back to campaigns don't speak to me. Campaigns don't reach out to me. Well, we've had in the last four years a, a huge uptick in interest in people wanting to speak to individual voters, which is why we created this new performance score, but also why we also include in every file both active and inactive voters. Inactive in most states actually means individuals who just haven't shown up for some period of time. States define them as such. This is another critical group to be able to find and speak to, especially if you're looking to engage those you know, high potential voters. Um, it's, a great, it's a great place to go. So with that, I know I'm, I'm up on time here, so I will uh, stop my screen share, but go back. I'm um, happy to take any questions at the end. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to see them in real time, but please let me know uh, if you have them. I'll stick around to the end. Thank you so much, Paul. There are a ton of questions in the Q&A box, so you might want to hop on in there and just start typing out some answers. Uh, right. People were pretty good at saying for Paul or L2, and for anyone who put their question in the chat, please make Paul's life easier and put it in that Q&A box. Um, and we'll, we should still have a little time, especially for some bigger picker, picture, sorry, bigger picture questions with all our panelists at the end. Uh, but I do wanna hop right into our next speaker. So we have Amy Bradley. Uh, she is a lifelong resident of New Hampshire, living in Manchester with her husband and two wonderful daughters and lovable dogs. Uh, for over 11 years, she's worked to shape progressive policies through activism and various organizations, such as Everytown, Lead New Hampshire, and State Voices. Uh, she previously served on the Manchester School Board and is currently a New Hampshire State Representative. Thanks for being here, Amy. We're going to talk about VAN, a tool that some of us might be a little more familiar with, but this presentation should be great, so I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, thank you everybody for having me. Um, as Caitlin mentioned, I am um, a long life resident of New Hampshire and today we are, I'm dreaming of Texas, the first couple of <laughs> speakers. It's so cold here. So um, dreaming of warmer weather. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. All right, so State Voices serves nonpartisan 501c3 organizations through our Tools for All program. Um, State Voices is affiliated state table staff support, table partners, and our national staff supports everybody else. Next slide. 
Um, so one of our biggest benefits that we provide to our partners is access to state data files supplemented by consumer modeled and USPS data um, that is accessible through the van. The van offers a space to centralize your, um, your organizing and contact data along with tools to contact people and integrations with a large number of contact tools. The data comes with a number of regular updates and it also comes with a hefty amount of um, support from national um, uh, State Voices staff. I could spend hours talking to you about the van, <laughs> um, but please, my email is on the first side, so reach out with any questions. Next slide. So what data is in my voters van? So each state has unique pieces of data available on the civic engagement file. In general, the list of registered voters in a state is collected by a state agency, such as the Board of Elections or Secretary of State's office, and is considered to be fairly accurate. Um, Catalyst then adds information for voting eligible people not yet registered to vote. Catalyst also provides additional enhancements to the data, such as phone numbers, change of address processing, and data standardization. The type of information on the voter file varies by state and includes what you see on the slide. Um, name, telephone, state, house district, and more. Next slide. So there's also model data. Um, so there's a series of models that can be used by clients. These models are usually created to predict relative likely behavior or attributes of voters using commercial data, voter file data, census data, polling data, and other information. These models can be very valuable and used in a multitude of ways. Catalyst, their clients, and State Voices partners are working continuously to create new models. Some of the models currently available include uh, what you see on the slide, so vote propensity, general, general activists, household income, and much more. So taking all that specified data, um, you're able to create lists that encompass the groups of people you're interested in reaching out to. It helps make your outreach more uh, effective and impactful. There's also a module called My Campaign, which allows partners to add volunteers. Uh, My Campaign is a powerful organizing tool to track volunteer management, create events, and set goals. So in My Campaign, users can cut turf, conduct calls, enter contacts, add new people. Um, it's not the voter file, but it is private to every specific committee or partner organization. So in addition to the van, some of our partners are using tools such as um, tools that focus on SMS, the voter file, support, and our pipeline. So some specific tools are Reach, which is a canvassing app to gather data anywhere by looking up people on the voter file. Through Talk, which is automated dialer that allows you to legally call cell phones. Through Text, which is a peer-to-peer -peer texting with two-way van integration. Um, ballot Ready, which is a vote by mail engine to assist voters in requesting their absentee ballot. An Action Network, a platform where you can create a group for an organization and create pledge cards, petitions, and other forms related to digital organizing. Okay, next slide, please. So State Voices just created, our data team just created our State Voices Tool Guide 2.0, and it is a ton of amazing information. So the link is up on the screen, so please check it out. Um, you can access it through our website. Um, and while you're on your website, if you want to subscribe to our Inside Voices newsletter for the latest on the tools and tech that we're offering. Okay, next slide. So in conclusion, with um, you know, collecting specific data to target your audiences, um, you can use VAN to turn out people to vote, put pressure on a legislator to support or oppose legislation, ask people to attend a rally or meeting, get more members or subscribers, bring more people to your website or blog, mobilize, analyze, and the, the biggest and import, most important one is building capacity for your organization. Um, next slide. 
So here's our contact information. So if you're in a state that is blue, you'd be in a table state. So you'd want to reach out to the data team to learn about what um, additional tools we offer and what support we offer. And if you are in a gray state, you can reach out to TFA support at State Voices, or you can reach out to me um, using the email on the first slide. And I encourage you to reach out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. And I see our Q&A box is also filling up with questions for you. So you can get in there and start answering some of those. And we're gonna go into our last speaker. So we're still gonna be talking about the van, but we're traveling back from New Hampshire, back down to Texas, uh, because we have Bo Fraga, who was born in Houston and raised in the East End. Bo attended the United States Air Force Academy and was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Air Force. Upon completing his active duty service commitment, Bo pursued a career in community service, first as a faith-based community organizer in St. Louis, and since 2009, the community developer and presently the civic engagement developer at Baker Ripley. Um, I have had the pleasure of working closely with Bo um, last year on a voter engagement project. Um, so I'm excited and feel like it's overdue that he is uh, on a nonprofit vote webinar sharing his wisdom and insights. So Bo, take it away. Thank you, Caitlin, and thank you all for uh, having me here to be one of the presenters and very thankful also to uh, State Voices. They've been a key partner of ours, a key resource. We're in one of the uh, gray states, you know, being in Texas for State Voices, but again, uh, it's also a great, they're a great resource. I didn't use them last year in 2020. I think like for all of us, the pandemic got us uh, somewhat off track in our work, uh, but we did a lot of fantastic voter engagement work with, uh, with Nonprofit Vote and also with the local coalition here in, in the Houston area, Houston in Action that uh, newly formed about two years ago. But I'm gonna share with you about our experience uh, with VAN, which has, been, uh, which has been very positive. And just as Amy was sharing that you can use VAN to turn out the vote, that's what we use it for. We've used it in several of our nonpartisan get out the vote or GOTV campaigns over the past uh, five years, yeah, going back to 2016. So as you can see on the slide, we use it to create the call sheets of people that we're going to call to encourage them to, to vote and to assist them in any way we can with information about the polling locations. If they need a ride, we can assist them with that. And then we also use it for creating the walk list for our block walks. And that's where uh, cutting the turf comes in for us. Definitely that gets closer to actually using maps uh, for our work. And on the, uh, on the slide here, I've got uh, just two photos that I took with my own cell phone of, of walk sheets, uh, excuse me, call sheets. And this is back, as you can see in my explanation there, 2019 for a school board race in one of our, in one of our area school districts, the Aldine Independent School District. So that's what the call sheet looks like. You know, it has the name of the person, the phone number, the address. And then I know it's hard to make out uh, there somewhere, but you can see the code, you know, if you've, uh, somebody refused uh, or if they did commit to vote and so forth. So that's what the uh, call sheets look like. And they're very, yeah, they're very helpful. I mean, that's how we run our get out the vote campaign. If we can go up to the next slide. So we also use it for block walking to create the walk sheets. And, and you can see on the photo on the right, it's a larger group of volunteers, staff, and also interns. And that's uh, at one of our community centers in the Southeast part of Houston. And they're about to go out and block walk. In 2019 for Houston, city of Houston, we had also school board race for Houston Independent School District and also for our mayor and city council and other local uh, government offices for that race. So they were going out for that. And in their clipboards, you can see that they have the walk sheets and also a flyer that we were giving to folks that had uh, basic information about the election, the dates, uh, the polling location closest to them for that part of, of the neighborhood where we were. And on, uh, and on the left side, you can see me, yeah, definitely walk the walk in, in the work that we do. I really enjoy getting out there and meeting voters and definitely appreciate Nonprofit Vote um, referring to these folks as uh, high potential voters, because that really is, you know, we've noticed when we do engage people, we're able to talk to them and explain what's going on. They do get interested and they do commit to voting. So that's great. It takes a lot of work, but uh, they, the, potential, the potential is definitely, definitely there. Next slide, please. So with, with that in mind about high potential, uh, we do focus on folks that normally do not vote. That's what we see is, uh, 
is our mission, so to speak, when it comes to voter engagement. Because you may have heard there's this, you know, the idea that there are enough voter, people who are registered to vote out there to make a difference in elections. We really need to get people out to vote who are already registered. So we focus on folks that have a propensity score of 40 and below, because we feel that if we do that, if we're able to change that, change that mindset, change that culture in terms of voting, that that's really gonna make a difference over the long term in these particular communities in Houston. We focus on 15 voter precincts in our area and they are where our five community centers are located. Our organization is, is very large. Uh, one of our big areas of work is through these five community centers that we have in different parts of the Houston area. So then we focus on the voting precincts where the center is located and then also uh, two or three that are adjacent to it. We really feel that we can we can really do more effective work at you know, turning out people to vote by, by focusing on those voting precincts that are right close to our centers because people notice, know, to, know us, excuse me, but it's also an opportunity to reach out to folks that may not be too familiar with us as well and be able to say, hey, we're at the community center that's just down the street or a few blocks away. Uh, these are voting precincts that are primarily communities of color and lower income. So again, we feel that if we're able to get folks out to vote who normally do not, that that's gonna be just more empowering for the community as a whole over the long term. And in the picture here, I have one of my colleagues, uh, Margie Pena, she's actually, she oversees our center in Pasadena, but when we do get out the vote work, it's an all out effort. And she was assisting us on one day up in East Alding, which is at another part of Harris County from where she is. And so here she's meeting with one of the folks that we, that we focus on and getting them out, out to vote. So Van is very, uh, very useful. Again, uh, we use it for turning out the vote. Uh, to print out our call sheets, to print out our walk sheets. And again, with the walk sheets comes an actual map of the turf or a section of the voting precinct that we're working on for that particular day. And uh, we target approximately about in each precinct about a thousand, a thousand voters. Uh, that's what basically our, our numbers are across these 15 voting precincts. Again, focusing on folks who have a propensity score of 40 and below. So I hope that gives you uh, at least a snapshot of how, how you can use VAN. And you know, I figure once we get uh, into 2022, we'll be back to block walking for sure. And we'll definitely be using VAN and getting reconnected with state voices and keeping our ongoing relationship with nonprofit vote. Thank you. Thanks, Bo. And I uh, took this quote from him um, because I think it's important that you all have some wisdom from the field that you can take from uh, one of your peers uh, as somebody working for a nonprofit that, you know, you might encounter uh, errors in the van or any sort of database. It can be frustrating, but it really is all worth it because it's so rewarding when you actually reach voters and they tell you that you've made a difference and now they're going to vote. Right, that's exactly the case. Thanks, Caitlin. So um, I do want to uh, jump into some Q&A with our last couple of minutes. So um, there's not a lot of time left. If you had a burning question you wanted to have answered, throw that in the chat, sorry, not the chat, into the Q&A box. Things are getting lost in the chat because there's a lot of activity. I can tell that this pre these presentations were really helpful. Um, for you and that they brought up a lot of questions and hopefully you will follow up directly with some of our speakers today. Um, so we do have some sort of bigger picture questions that I do wanna get into and panelists, I understand you're trying to answer questions in the Q and A box and these questions I'm asking you. So don't worry if it takes a moment, um, but Somebody asked right in the beginning a great question about how could these tools be used to engage communities around redistricting and public mapping projects. Nonprofit Vote did a webinar about redistricting in February, so it's a topic we care a lot about. Um, I see Paul did answer this question. Um, Paul, if you want to give your answer or um, if anybody else has anything about how to use redistricting, use these tools for redistricting. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can jump in on that. So we're used by numerous redistricting, uh, both companies, there's independent companies, and of course, cities themselves, state legislatures, caucuses, basically anyone with an interest in redistricting, because once you have the mapping data, or excuse me, you have the mapping tool, you have the ability to draw lines around a given area, and you can actually create your own boundaries. 
One part of the tool I didn't have a chance to show you as well is we have the ability to display the current boundaries and previous boundaries within the system. And we're constantly collecting those and in fact, drawing our own based on the file. It's proprietary technology we have. So you can see even precinct boundaries from the very latest voter file. So you've got that in there. So what a lot of organizations will do is they'll look at the old boundaries and then they'll draw their new boundaries or potentially go even a step further and take the uh, boundaries that some organization or group has come out with. They'll hand them to us and privately in their application will display them. So they can say, oh, the you know XYZ group has created this. And then they can see, oh, it looks like they're trying to wrap a district around a heavily Republican area, Democrat area, whatever it is. And they're able to point it out and shed some light on it. So that's one instance. Tons of use cases, but that's that's the big one. Thanks, Paul. Um, while I, I'll give our other panelists a moment to jump in if they have anything on redistricting while I look at our question queue and pull out our next one. I'm not finding it, but I did see one about training. So Paul, since you're already with us, Will you quickly just tell us about what sort of training opportunities folks can get around L2 and then we'll go through all our other panelists as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the best the best way to do a training, we've got a link on the website. It's, it'll say sign up for demo. Um, essentially in that box, you're actually able to log in and say whether you'd wanna be um, on our email list. and. We don't spam you, we don't market to you, or essentially we're using this as providing you with L2 updates. So when we update our voter files, all of that information. So you can sign up for that. That will also sign you up to receive information about when we do these trainings on the platform. So we do every other week, will rotate between a basic training and an advanced training. The basic training is the beginners. It's the few minutes of what I showed you times you know, another 50 minutes or so. And then the advanced training goes into some of the more in-depth portions of the tool of how to do you know, some of the advanced reporting tools that are available in there using the Haystack model data, things like that. So we do that, just sign up on our website for that. Or if for some reason you're confused or lost with it, I put my email somewhere in there, but feel free to uh, just shoot me an email or email info at you know, our website. Yes, and we have your email in, I think the presentation, which will be mailed out to everyone. Perfect, perfect. Um, I know that State Voices has a lot of training, um, but Amy, if you can hop on and just say a little bit about what is offered by State Voices around using VAN. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, there is a lot. Um, we actually offer, if anybody needs a training in van, they can just reach out to um, the TFA at, um, at Safe Voices to connect with us. And we are happy to put together, you know, a mini training at any time. So there's, there's that. We're also offering um, over the summer, um, Enrollment just closed for this training yesterday, um, but we're going to be continuing to offer our um, data certificate our data certification program, or we call it DCP because it's a lot easier to say. Um, it's a month long program to learn, to like to really dig into VAN. Um, it's a month long self-paced program. It's about, depending three to five hours a week of training. Um, I believe it's $150 for the month, but we do have stipends. So that's going to be something we're gonna be offering into the future. Um, over the summer, we're also offering a digital track. So. We offer a lot of trainings and if there's something very specific, if you're having a hard time, you know, I don't know, exporting a, a list the way you want it to export from Van. I mean, there's so many things that can happen. Feel free to reach out to us um, and we're more than happy to help you or have a training or whatever your needs are. Thanks, Amy. Um, I know we have hit the hour and so some folks are jumping off totally okay. We will send out um, the answered Q&A in the follow-up. Um, but um, Bo, if you're still with us, we got a question. I don't want to put you too much on the spot, but somebody actually emailed us a question about how tools could be used for peer-to-peer -peer work. And I'm wondering if Baker Ripley has thought about any of the relational organizing aspects and maybe if Van could be used for that or how you've sort of thought about that in general. I think you were getting into that a little bit last year. Yes, yeah, so yeah, we've definitely thought about peer-to-peer -peer specifically to get uh, 
you know, newly registered high school students to then encourage their fellow high school students to also get registered and then to turn out to vote. And so we've been trying to explore how to do that, particularly using, you know, texting, a texting platform because, you know, feel that youngsters like that more so. So we have looked into that. And also, you know, based on a work with you all last year, also looking at um, getting those folks that are in our leadership program at our different centers that come from those neighborhoods to get them also to reach out to folks who are already registered to get them out to vote. So we are exploring that further. I do foresee that in 2022, we'll actually try, we will actually pilot uh, some of these, some of these kind of say methods, if you will, on that. And so I, I definitely uh, encourage everyone to look into that as well, you know, so that it uh, just reinforces the work that, that we're doing and also that development and capacity building in the community. Thanks, Bo. So since we are past time, um, we're going to wind down this webinar. I'm going to save this q and I'm going to make sure that all our speakers, even if they had to hop off before they got to all these awesome questions, have a chance to get them answered so that we can get that back to you all in that follow-up email next week. Um, Again, I thank all of our speakers for being here and lending their time, expertise, and showing us their tools. Uh, please, please uh, sort of pay this forward by giving us some feedback in that end of webinar survey so that we know what you want to hear about. Um, so with that, I will wish everyone a very happy Thursday. You'll hear from us about our next webinar, which will be on the benefits of voting in local elections, which will be sometime in May. All right, so signing off for Nonprofit Vote. Bye, everyone. <laughs>